the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we are now in the month of June. Welcome to this program entitled, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. This program is based on the inspired and approved, ecclesiastically approved, writings of the servant of God, Luisa Picareta. As many of you know, she penned 36 volumes and many other works, ranging from the Christmas Novena to the Childhood Memoirs to the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will to the Pious Pilgrimage of the Soul and so forth. And of many of these works, two of them bear the official seals of ecclesiastical approval, that is, the Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary book. And both of these works were dictated respectively by Jesus and Mary to Louisa. The focus of last month, the month of May, was on the book approved with the official magisterial seals of the Imprimatur and Hilipstadt, The Blessed Virgin Mary and the Kingdom of the Divine Will. In this book, Mary encourages us, teaches us, exhorts us how to live in the divine will. She encourages us to live in it through the lessons that endure for 36 days. So that technically puts us at day five. On this month of June, June 5th, we are in the fifth meditation. There were 31 lessons for each day of the month of May, followed by six additional meditations at the request of St. Hannibal, her spiritual director. So before meditating on day five, or I should rather say meditation five, following the 31 days of the month of May, I would like to pick up the thread where we left off last time, and that was last Saturday, which would have been May the 29th. So let us cover the days we have not yet addressed. That is day 30 of May, day 31 of May, then meditations one through five inclusive. So without any further ado, let us go back to day 30, where we left off. And this Day talks about Mary infusing in all of our acts, words, and heartbeats the food of the divine will. And what is this food? There's a theology on this word, food of the divine will. An entire book could be written about what this word food means. It also was referred to as nourishment, daily bread. But the point is, Mary, through her lessons, wishes to nourish our souls, not our bodies necessarily, but our souls. So she tells Louisa on day 30, if you are faithful to me, your mother, I will no longer leave you, but will always be with you to infuse in each one of your acts, words, and heartbeats the heavenly food of the divine will. We get an insight into what this food is when we go to volume three, January 31st, 1900. Let us review this passage from this day. Here, Jesus tells Louisa, it is not enough for the soul to have grace in the in order to have life. Now, what does this mean? The gift of living in the divine will implies life, okay? So life refers to the reception of the gift of God's divine will. So when Jesus tells Louisa, it is not enough for the soul to have grace in order to have life, he makes a distinction between grace and life. So let us read the full sentence. It is not enough for the soul to have grace in order to have life, but food is needed to nourish the soul and raise it to the proper stature. What is this food? It is the soul's correspondence. So grace and correspondence to it form the links of the chain which lead the soul to heaven. And according to the measure in which the soul corresponds to grace, 
it keeps forming these links of this chain. All right, let us pause there and review this. So the food Mary refers to on May 31st is the soul's correspondence to God's grace. You see, God's grace is not enough for the soul to attain holiness. Why? Because if the soul does not correspond to it, grace is wasted. Take, for example, a rock and a sponge that represent, respectively, a soul that is not properly disposed to receive communion and the sponge, the soul that is disposed to receive it. When the soul that is not disposed, let's take an extreme case, a soul approaches the Eucharist after having committed a crime, like a murder or something, and it has not confessed its sin, and it is not sorry for its sin. When that soul receives Jesus in the Eucharist, which is full of grace, the soul does not absorb that grace. Sort of like water being poured over a rock. The rock does not absorb the water. Contrarily, if the soul was disposed like a sponge, it would absorb that water, and the water represents the grace of the Eucharist. So you see, God gives his grace to us all the time, every passing second. Multiform grace. You have natural grace, which keeps our bodies alive, which keeps the atomical and molecular structure together. That emulsifying physical agent is sustained by supernatural grace of God, but within our human nature. So this grace that keeps all the physical structures in the world together in their proper place is called natural grace, because it's grace that keeps nature together. Then you have um, what is called sanctifying grace that is received only at baptism, which is a permanent disposition in the soul that inclines it to turn to God. Then you have actual grace, which are the interventions of God throughout life. So let's suppose I'm in peril. God will intervene to help me. That's it. That's what's called actual grace. These interventions of God to help us physically, spiritually, mentally, morally, etc. Then you have cooperating grace, operating grace, habitual grace, efficacious grace, and then the list goes on. So rather than belabor the point and explain every type of grace there is, and there's over 12 types of grace, according to the writings of the scholastics, what I wish to emphasize only is that grace requires correspondence. We must correspond to God's grace, all right? So our correspondence is the food, the nourishment of the soul that enables grace to penetrate it, that enables the soul to absorb God's grace. So Jesus tells Louisa, grace and correspondence to it form the links of the chain which lead the soul to heaven. And according to the measure in which the soul corresponds to grace, it keeps forming the links of this chain. So here we have a progression at work. You see, when we live in the divine will, it is not a point of arrival and stagnation. We don't get the gift and then remain immobile. Rather, the gift elicits from us a perpetual growth in grace. So that in, even in heaven, among the blessed and angels, there is no cessation of growth. These individuals who live in God's divine will are perpetually increasing. And their rate of growth in heaven is determined, that is for the saints, is determined by their rate of growth in holiness or correspondence to God's grace on earth. So if a soul on earth is sluggish in its growth, that rate of growth will be fixed for all eternity in heaven in a slow way. But it still grows. Or as a soul that is very fervent, on fire for God, and up gives up everything it has, like Jesus says in the gospel, a person finding that precious pearl who sells everything he has and buys up the field where that pearl is contained, that kind of soul will grow at an extraordinarily fast rate for all eternity in heaven, because that rate was established already here on earth. And for those souls who come to God late in life, there's no reason to despair. 
the fervor with which they work for God's glory, for God's interests, makes up for their past um, wayward ways. Jesus gives this example in the parable of the hired workers who came at different hours, some at nine o'clock, some at noon, some at three o'clock, and they were all at the end of the day given the same wage. What does this mean? It means that those who come late to work in God's vineyard, if they work with zeal, will be paid the same amount as those who were always in God's vineyard, who were cradle Catholics or cradle Christians, because they make up for lost time by their zeal. So, correspondence to God's grace is absolutely essential, not only to live in the divine will, to have life, but also to progressively increase in that union with God's will. You know, Louisa received the gift of living in the divine will at the age of 24, but she did not penetrate its core, its nucleus, its kernel, its center, until the age of 35, on November 16th, 1900. And even then, she continued to <clears throat> grow in degrees within that center of the divine will. Mary, on the other hand, was conceived within the center of God's divine will. How about that? This is why no human being could ever rival or surpass Mary's holiness. No rational being ever can rival Mary's holiness. And for this reason, she is for always the queen, not only of God's divine will, which is in and of itself everything, but of all angels and saints and all rational beings that ever were or, or will be. She is the only rational creature that God had conceived within the center of his divine will. So from the start, she was already at the apex of holiness. It took Louisa, and it takes us many years to get there, if ever many of us do. But when we get to heaven, we will all be there. So Jesus tells Louisa on the same passage of January 31st, 1900, from volume 3, what is the passport to enter into the kingdom of grace? It is humility. Through humility, by always looking at its own nothingness and seeing that it is nothing but dust and when the soul will place all of its trust in grace, so much so as to make grace its master. And grace, taking dominion over all, the, all of the soul in its entirety, leads it along the path of all the virtues and makes it reach the summit of perfection. So you see, without grace, there is no living in the divine will. And without correspondence to grace, there is no living in the divine will. You know, Louisa, not being catechized like most of us, you know, she was limited only to a first great education. You see, the Italian school is a little different than ours. They don't have grade one, kindergarten, grade one through six, and then middle school, then high school like we do. Their breakdown of curriculum studies is a little bit different. So Louise's education would correspond to the American curriculum to about a grade and a half, just past first grade, not quite at second grade. And that was the the limit of her education. So she was not catechized like most of us in the knowledge of grace, you know, and what it means and how it operates. So when she was doing her rounds, she would sometimes forget to fuse herself in the order of grace. So Jesus would have to remind her to do that. And this is a lesson for us. Remember, the divine will does not exist without grace. Oftentimes we invoke the divine will, but forget about invoking grace. And we have to do that. Why? Because Jesus told Louisa she should do it. Take, for example, on May 17th, 1925, Jesus tells her, My daughter, to all you have said concerning the fusing of yourself in my will, another application must be added. That of fusing yourself in the order of grace. 
in all that which the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit, has done and will do in those who are to be sanctified. So you see here, Louisa is reminded by our Lord, you're doing a fine thing by fusing yourself in my will, but don't forget to fuse yourself in grace. You have to do it. And we have to do it as well. Sometimes we get so caught up, and not in a bad way, in a good way, of God's one eternal act operating in everything we do that we forget the fundamentals. We cannot exist without grace. And we have to appreciate that. It's sort of like a man running up the stairs in, in a plane and he trips three times and he keeps tripping. You know, sometimes we focus on the door of the plane and we forget that right beneath our feet are stairs we have to pay attention to. <laughs> we have to focus on the fundamentals sometimes. And this order of grace, what is it? You know, Jesus refers to this twice. He refers to this on May, January 31st, 1900 in volume three. And here on May 17th, 1925 in volume 17. What is this kingdom of grace, this order of grace that one, the soul must fuse itself in, in addition to fusing itself in the divine will? Well, it is that which Christ said, all that which the sanctifier has done and will do in those who are to be sanctified. Now let us get the full flavor of this passage. Louisa writes, again, May 17th, 1925, I continued by saying that my sweet Jesus revealed, my daughter, to all you have said on fusing yourself in my will, another application must be added, that of fusing yourself in the order of grace. In all that the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit, has done and will do in those who are to be sanctified. Furthermore, we, the three divine persons, remain always united in working. So if creation is related to the Father, redemption to the Son, the fiat voluntas tua is attributed to the Holy Spirit. And it is exactly in the fiat voluntas tua that the divine Spirit will display its work. And you do this when in coming before the Supreme Majesty you say, I come to give love in return for everything which the sanctifier does to those who are to be sanctified. Let me repeat that. Jesus is telling Louisa that the Father creates, the Son redeems, the Spirit sanctifies. And the Holy Spirit displays his work in this third fiat, the fiat voluntas tua, your will be done. All right? And he tells Louisa, you are able to display the Holy Spirit's work when you come before the Supreme Majesty and say, I come to give love in return for everything. I come to requite your love in exchange for all that which you have given. And for all that which the sanctifier does to those who are to be sanctified. Remember the passage in scripture where Jesus said, or Paul says, Christ has once and for all time sanctified those who are to be sanctified. Well, this is almost the same words Jesus uses in relation to the Holy Spirit. Why? Because in John 16, 12, Jesus says, I will send another in my name who will remind you of all the truth and lead you to the truth. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit are doing one work together, and that is sanctification. Certainly Jesus redeems and the Holy Spirit sanctifies, but that does not mean when the Holy Spirit sanctifies, Jesus is not cooperating with him. He is. In all three fiats, all three divine persons are engaged. But one is the agent, while the other two are concurring. These are words right out of Louisa's text. When the Father is the agent of creation, agente in Italian, the Spirit and the Son concorrono, they concur in that work. And when the Son is the agent, agente, of the work of redemption, the Father and the Spirit concorrono. They concur. And when the Spirit is sanctifying all rational beings and irrational beings, the Father and the Son concorrono. They concur in that work. So you see here, as in the Gospel, or rather in the letter of Paul, 
both the Son and the Spirit have sanctified all those who are to be sanctified. You see, they have done it already in a timeless manner. Jesus did it on earth 2,000 years ago. He has purchased for all of us, all human beings who have yet to come into existence or who have existed, all the grace necessary to attain perfection. But this grace is not yet actualized in us. It's latent, waiting to be activated. What actualizes this? The Holy Spirit. But not without our correspondence to grace. The Holy Spirit cannot actualize this gift in us unless we actively cooperate with grace. So we are, like Louisa, to appreciate grace by coming before the Supreme Majesty and saying, I come to give you love in return for everything which the sanctifier does to those who are to be sanctified. I come to enter into the order of grace to give you glory in return for love as if all had become saints, and to make reparation for all the oppositions and lack of correspondence to grace on the part of souls. This is the prayer Jesus asks Louisa to do on May um, 17th, 1925, in volume 17. And we should do this prayer as well. So having explained now the distinction between grace and life, and the necessity for us to correspond to God's grace in order to have life in the divine will, let us pray this prayer together that Jesus asked Louisa to say. Jesus composed this prayer for Louisa. You know, some people say Jesus only taught one prayer in Scripture, the Our Father, and they're right. But in the writings of Louisa, he teaches us other prayers, and this is one of them. I come before you, Supreme Majesty, to requite love for all the love you've given through the sanctifier to those who are to be sanctified. I come to enter into the order of grace to give you glory in exchange of love as if all had become saints and to make reparation to you for all the oppositions and lack of correspondence to grace on the part of souls. Jesus tells Louisa, if we do this prayer, then we will display the Holy Spirit's work in this fiat voluntas to this third fiat of sanctification. And we must not simply infuse, our, infuse ourselves in the divine will, but also fuse ourselves in the order of grace. Now, this is on day 30, where Mary tells Louisa that she infuses in all of our acts, words, and heartbeats the food of the divine will. And this food, as we found on January 31st, 1900, and May 17th, 1925, and also, I'll share another passage with you, is the nourishment of the soul to receive the gift of living in the divine will. And Mary's purpose of giving us these 36 lessons for the month of May is to lead us into the kingdom of the divine will by nourishing our souls. She's the one who infuses in our souls this food. Think about that. Mary infuses this food within our souls if we ask for it. Now, the passage I also wanted to share with you, the other passage, is um, from volume 17, October 6th, 1924. Here Jesus tells Louisa that the soul must fuse itself in God's will and in his grace, like Mary did. And um, he also reiterates this on March 18th, 1917, in volume 12. He tells Louisa, May your life on earth be completely fused in me. Don't do any act without making it first enter within me. And every time you fuse yourself in me, I will pour in you new graces and new light. 
and I will become the vigilant sentry of your heart in order to keep far from you any shadow of sin. I will guard you as my own humanity, and I will command the angels to surround you like a crown, that you may be sheltered from everything and from everyone. Well, at this halfway mark, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I wish to remind you to continue to be generous in supporting Radio Maria. As we are generous in providing you with this commercial free and completely listener supported program, among other programs, may you be as kind in requiting the favor by supporting Radio Maria with your prayers and your monetary donations. Now, on day 31, we see. Reveal, we receive from Mary the revelation of her assumption into heaven. It is telling that the divine will filled her with grace. The same theme of grace in day 30 is picked up in 31. The divine will filled her with grace in each word she spoke. And by this means, by this grace God fills her with, she binds our souls, the souls of the reader, to the divine will, again by infusing in us God's grace. So Mary is really the mediatrix of all grace, but not just the mediatrix, but the infuser. She is the one who infuses in all of us the grace of God, makes us abound in God's love and his mercy, and reflect that mercy and love to other souls. You see, I will get in a moment to the multiplication, which is on Meditation 1, which follows Day 31. But what God wants to do with us in the divine will is make us other Christs. He wants us to reproduce the image and likeness of the icon of perfection, which is Christ himself, and our individual respective human natures. And we cannot do this. Remember what Jesus told Louisa. He said that in order to Fuse yourself in the order of grace, you must enter into your own nothingness. Let me repeat that. It was a beautiful passage. Because this is the key to humility. He tells Louisa, again, this is on January 31st, 1900, Volume 3. What is the passport to enter into the kingdom of grace? It is humility. Through humility, by always looking at its nothingness and seeing that it is nothing but dust or wind. The soul places all its trust in grace, so much as to make it her master. So here, God exhorts us to acknowledge ourselves for who we are, to be realists. Let me ask you a question, all of you who are listening. Where did you come from? What did you do to bring yourself into existence? What did you do to merit your status in life? To Um, be entitled to receive all the blessings you've received in life. You've done practically nothing except react to what was given to you, right? (laughs) You simply reacted and made good of what you had, but you didn't obtain anything. I didn't obtain it. None of us obtained anything. We are dust, and this is what is said at Lent, as you well know, and to dust we shall return. That is humility. The problem is, The world and its hustle and bustle and automation and industry distracts us from the simple fundamental truth that is pivotal for us to be humble. So what do we have to do? We have to stop throughout the day from time to time and call to mind the simple truth that we, in fact, and without any hyperbole or exaggeration, are literally nothing. That's not an exaggeration, it's a fact. We are nothing. You know, some people say, oh, Louise, you say, I am nothing, God is all. How pious, how nice. Actually, she wasn't pious. She was speaking the truth. <laughs> There's nothing pious about it. It's a, it's a fact. We are nothing. We came from nothing, and our bodies will return to nothing. But because of God's largesse, his pure love and charity that infuses within us, due to no merit of our own, his gratuity, his grace, We have eternal life. 
in our bodies and in our souls. So God's grace alone will raise our immortal bodies to life after they have decomposed. And he will reinfuse within it that which animated it on earth, which is his spirit, which bequeaths to us a soul. You know, the Catechism speaks of human nature as being comprised of a body and a soul. But Paul, and that's and it's correct. But Paul speaks of also a spirit. May God sanctify you, he says, in body, soul, and spirit. Keeping you irreproachable. This is in First Thessalonians 5.23. It says, may God, the God of peace himself, sanctify you entirely, his body, soul, and spirit, to preserve you without blame for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you have this tripartition of Paul, the body, soul, and spirit. And Pope John Paul II speaks of what the spirit is as a distinct entity of the soul in his theology of the body. By the way, the theology of the body is not a book the Pope wrote, which many people think. It's rather a collection of sermons he gave at his Wednesday general audience that are compiled together. And in one of his sermons, he spoke of the Spirit being the point of entry in the human soul of the Holy Spirit. So you see, we may have a soul, just like dogs have a soul, cats have a soul, the sun has a soul, the stars have a soul, anything with animation has a soul. That's what soul means, anima, animation. But it doesn't imply rationality until the Spirit the Holy Spirit, the sanctifier, enters the soul and infuses within it rationality. This is what separates us from the beasts, rationality and volition. Now, volition implies a will with rationality. That's what volition means. Sometimes people have asked, what's the difference in Louise's writings between volere, volontà, and volizione? These are three words she uses for will. Volontà, which is will, that is the will common to all human natures. We all have a human will. Volizione, which is a will endowed with rationality. And then volere, which is the actual verb, the, the will in motion, willing something. So that's the difference between volontà, volere, volizione. For those who are curious to know the, this distinction in the Italian grammar that Luisa uses. But they all signify the divine will in practicality, operating in us. Now, the um, will of God that Mary elicits us to correspond to through her binding our souls to the divine will as she speaks, infusing within us God's grace, enables us to multiply the life of Christ, to become another Christ, to reproduce Christ's image and likeness within us. And this brings us to Meditation 1, okay? And in Meditation 1, we will come across the visitation, the mystery of the visitation. Here, Mary helps us, our souls, fill the voids caused by the human will with love. And Mary multiplies Jesus in our souls. And this is what Mary tells Louisa, was the greatest miracle she ever performed. Remember, Mary never performed any visible miracles. It was not her place to do that. And some wonder why. They say, you know, Mary's the greatest of all angels and saints, and there have been many saints who raise the dead, who perform miracles. Why didn't Mary perform any? If she's so great, if she's far surpassing all other humans in sanctity, why didn't she perform any visible miracles? And the answer is simple, because it was not God's will. <laughs> That's it. Mary had her role, and it was to be hidden, to be humble. And in that hiddenness contain the entire cosmos and God himself to the unawares of most. So on day 31, the visitation, Mary encourages us to receive this food that she wishes to infuse within us by listening to her words, because it is in her speaking that the grace with which she is filled transmits to us. 
So Mary tells Louisa, My The motherly love I possessed for all souls, and for you in particular, was so great that I felt ardent yearnings to give my dear Jesus to everyone so that all might possess him and love him. The rightful claims to motherhood that I possess bequeathed to me by the fiat enriched me with such power that this fiat operating in me multiplied Jesus for as many times as there are souls who desire to receive him. This was the greatest miracle given me to perform. And again, if Mary worked this greatest miracle in her life to the unawares of those around her, Louisa adds that Mary never performed any visible miracles in her life. And this is revealed on June 1st, 1927 in volume 22, where Louisa states, if in life our great heavenly mother did not perform any visible miracles, either healings or of raising the dead, she nevertheless performed and continues to perform at each moment miracles at every hour and every day. And the greatest miracle, Mary here tells Louisa, that she performed was multiplying Jesus for as many times as there are souls who desire to receive him, to have Jesus always available in order to give him to whomever should desire him. And this was the entire Purpose of the mystery of the visitation. You know, St. Francis de Sales' favorite meditation of all the mysteries of the life of Jesus and Mary, you know what it was? The visitation. Because he got it. He cracked the code. He understood the mystery behind this this um, second decade of the joyful mysteries. And that is that Mary contained within herself God and wanted to multiply the life of God in all. This is the mystery of the visitation. It wasn't just visiting Elizabeth and caring for her while she was pregnant, about to give birth to John the Baptist. That was secondary. The primary purpose of Mary's visit was to begin to multiply the life of Jesus in all souls. And it began with the visitation. And she doesn't stop multiplying Jesus in us. She continues to do this every hour, every day, mystically, by nourishing our souls with our correspondence to the grace that she possesses and that filled her. And then we come to this multiplication of Jesus and souls in the volumes as well. Take, for example, I'm going to pull up a passage here. Um, Volume 14, March 24th, 1922. Here Jesus tells Louisa, I desire to multiply my life every day in as many hosts, this is the Eucharist, in as many hosts as there are souls that exist in order to give myself to them, but I await in vain. My will remains ineffective. Still, what I have decided will have its fulfillment, and this is why I choose another means, that is, by multiplying myself in every living act the soul accomplishes in my will, in order that they may substitute for the multiplication of my sacramental lives." Ah, yes, only these souls who live in my will shall substitute for all the communions that others do not receive and for all the consecrations that priests do not do. In them I will find everything, even the multiplication of my own sacramental life. Again, this comes from volume 14, March 24th, 1922. Now, this does not mean Souls who live in God's divine will replace the priesthood or replace the consecration of the bread and wine. No, this is a different type of consecration that does not replace the priesthood. It is in addition to the priesthood that substitutes the lack of glory that is produced by those who fail to receive communion, who fail to offer up the Mass, etc., God always finds an alternative means, you know? He's the master of puzzles. 
you know, Satan thought he had God baffled when he enabled, when he duped Adam and Eve and um, made them commit original sin. Satan thought that he had the entire human race doomed. And he was actually right, because Satan knew that Adam was the head of the human race, and that if Adam had fallen, there would be no more human race. Satan wants to destroy the human race, you know? And God foresaw this before Satan tempted Adam and even made them fall. God saw this. So God provided the master alternative plan, and that was redemption. Satan did not see that coming. So God is always a billion steps ahead of any rational mind, angelic or human, because he created all human minds and he knows every thought of every mind. Nonetheless, he wants us to offer reparation, to replace the glory that is missing among the choirs of angels and saints in heaven, among even all creation that exists today, and even among the Trinity. I'm speaking of accidental glory, of course, not essential glory. By multiplying Jesus in every thought, word, and action of ours, how do we do it? Again, back to the well, the fundamentals. We must acknowledge that we are nothing, enter into humility, because it, we don't do anything. We cannot. We do not have the power. God has the power. So what do we do? We attract God's power by our lowliness. So we acknowledge that we are dust. And that only through God's gratuity and love does he make us other images of, of, of Christ. And with this attitude, God approaches us and fills us to the point of overflowing, surrounding us, on the left, right, forward, before, behind us, and inside of us, much like the light that endowed the bodies of Adam and Eve. That was really God's grace, visibly present in the bodies of Adam and Eve, that literally illuminated them, much like the light, the taboric light of Christ at the moment of the transfiguration. In this fallen world, we don't see grace. In Eden, they saw grace. They literally were able to see grace at work. We cannot see it in this wounded world because this is not Eden. This is really an exile, a wounded environment where God is restoring to us the interior preternatural union that Adam and Eve enjoyed before original sin while not being able to see all the external endowments that were present in Eden. So this is a land of testing and trial and humility is the key in order for us to fuse ourselves in the order of grace, in order for Mary, therefore, to elevate our souls to the status of divine sonship and lead us to the center of the divine will through her words that are revealed to us. And we, by reading her messages and corresponding to them, cooperate with Mary, the queen of the divine will, the mediatrix of all grace, to multiply Christ, not only in our thoughts, words, and actions, but in the lives of others. And otherwise put, we, like Mary, can be co-redeemers with Christ. We can help transmit grace to other souls like Mary transmits it to us and in so doing not only save souls but sanctify them as well. Louisa maintains that as the soul accomplishes its acts in the divine will, God not we, assimilates them to his own acts and to those of his blessed mother. God is the one behind all this. And in this way, Jesus' real presence in the Eucharist remains surrounded by redoubled acts, redoubled love, and by greater glory. See, Jesus' real life <clears throat> is really the same as his real presence in the Eucharist. The life of God's divine will reigning in us is referred to in Louise's writings as his real life, capital R, capital L. And there is no difference between this real life and the soul who lives in God's divine will 
and God's real presence in the Eucharist, capital R, capital P. This was a term defined by the Council of Trent to define the Eucharist, the real presence of God. Jesus is present body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. Well, guess what? When we receive the gift of living in the divine will, Jesus is present body, blood, soul, and divinity in us. This is called his real life. He multiplies his life within us. And this leads us to the complete life in the divine will, which is found on November 25th, 1912, in volume 11. Let me read this passage to you and then move on to meditation too. My daughter, along the golden stairway, souls ascend who live their lives in union with my complete life. Wherefore, I may say that they are my feet, my hands, my heart, my entire being. I am their life. And their actions are of pure gold and of incalculable wealth, for they are divine. No one can attain their heights, for they constitute my own life. Hardly anyone recognizes them, much like the Blessed Mother, as you may recall. She didn't perform any visible miracles. So Jesus says, hardly anyone recognizes them, for they are hidden in me. Only in heaven will perfect knowledge of them be made known. Along the wooden stairway, there are more souls. These are the souls of those who walk along the way of the virtues, yes, but neither in union with my complete life, nor in continuous cooperation with my will. Their actions are of wood, not of gold, and therefore their value is minimal. Comparatively, these souls are small, almost scrawny, as many human purposes are mixed in with their own good actions, and human purposes produce no growth. They are known to everyone because they are not hidden in me, but in themselves. They will not cause any surprise in heaven since they were already known on earth. Therefore, my daughter, I want you in union with my complete life while doing nothing of your own will. And I entrust to you the souls you know to see to it that they may keep themselves strong and constant along the stairway of my life. Okay, so God wants us to be hidden with him in Christ, to acknowledge that we are nothing, and by entering into humility, fuse ourselves in the order of grace. And infusing ourselves in the order of grace, cooperate with God's life that is being communicated to us through Mary, who infuses within us through her words, through her lessons, the food, the nourishment of the divine will. She fills the voids in our soul caused by the human will, with love. She fills these voids with her love and multiplies within us Jesus so that we may multiply Jesus in our thoughts, words, and actions in other souls. It is God who multiplies our thoughts, words, and actions in other souls, much like it is God who does this in Mary and through Mary in us. God is behind it all. All we have to do is correspond to God's grace, desire the divine will earnestly, with an upright intention, firm desire, and God does the rest. You do your best, and God will do the rest, okay? And very briefly, before concluding in the remaining few minutes, in meditation too, we come across the circumcision of Christ, where the blood of Christ, that I touched upon in the last um, meditation of... Um, last Saturday, which was May the 29th, is redeeming, is the key ingredient to the redemption of all souls, the blood of Christ. That was shed for the first time here at the circumcision. And this blood of Christ, Mary administers throughout all human generations, along with Louisa, and invites us to do the same as co-redeemers with Mary the co-redemptrix. And then on Meditation 3, we come to the Adoration of the Magi. And this is an elaboration on Day 23 of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine World Book of the month of May. And this was more elaborated on because Hannibal wanted Mary to touch upon in more detail um, the Magi and the Star and um, the um, mystical rapture, you know, that um, they were caught in when they brought their frankincense, myrrh, and um, gold before the infant Jesus and what they represented. And how Jesus 
would be the star for all Gentile nations. And again, Mary, continuing her office of multiplying Jesus and everyone, that begins with the visitation, is found again here, where she places Jesus at everyone's disposal for them to adore him, including the Magi, the shepherds, and so forth. And then on day four, Mary presents Jesus to the temple and gives us an example of obedience. Though Jesus was exempt from the Mosaic law, he wanted Mary to respect and follow it and set an example for us as well. And then day five, which is today, the meditation of the finding of the child Jesus in the temple. And in this mystery, Mary reminds us that there are many who go to church and pray, but the prayer they direct to God remains on their lips because their hearts and minds are far from him. And she is really hurt by this. And one of the occupational hazards of being a cradle Christian is we take things for granted. We, in our rosary recitation or in our external observation, genuflecting and bowing and folding our hands, do it more out of routine than purpose. And here Mary reminds us that such individuals who pray minimize the effect of their prayer. How much of reverence, she says, is there in the house of God? If all souls made an effort to imitate our example, she's speaking of Mary, Jesus, and Joseph, how many scourges would be spared and chastisements converted into grace throughout the world? Only the prayer that comes from a soul in whom the divine will reigns acts in an irresistible way upon the heart of God. Such a prayer is so powerful that it conquers God and obtains from him the greatest grace. Therefore, be sure to live in the divine will, and I, your mother who loves you, will vest your prayers with the same qualities of my own powerful intercession. So let us do that. Let us turn to the Blessed Mother and ask her to feed us with the food of the divine will, to vest our prayers with her own intercession, and to take us by the hand and under her mantle into the portals of heaven, where we may, already on earth now, interiorly experience the beatific vision, at least in part. May God bless you and keep you always in his will, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.